Good morning, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy and Future. And today my guest is Professor Hugh White from Australia. Good morning, Professor. Hi, Hugh. Good morning, Jacek. How are you? Great to be with you again. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. With, uh, before we start recording, we exchange our opinions about the weather and the, the seasons of the year, both in Australia and Poland. And just for, for the audience to know, we have, uh, of course, a gloomy autumn in Poland, and it's not very optimistic always. So it's the worst period <laughs> of the year. Um, of course, of course, everybody uh, who listens to Strategy and Future knows Professor Hugh White, um, a, a renowned expert on, on, on security and, and uh, geopolitics and international affairs. So without further ado, let's get started. And many things are happening. So, but let me let me let me begin by asking you the following question: uh, From across the world, it seems that the Australian government is changing its attitude towards China, and is uh, is I don't know how to say it is 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 doing a new opening or or a new commercial uh, 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 interactions with uh, with China. Could you could you tell us more? Uh, what do you think about it? What is really happening, and what what stands behind? What rationale is behind the yeah. uh, the prime minister yeah. moves? Yeah. Look. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jacek. It's a it's um it's a big issue here in Australia. Uh, uh, certainly, our prime minister and the Albanese has just returned a few days ago, and he hasn't yet returned. He's now in the South Pacific uh, from a visit to Beijing, the first visit by an Australian prime minister in seven years. Um. And immediately before he was, less than a week before he went to, to China, he was in a, on a visit to Washington. So he's done this very significant pairing of um, of almost simultaneously visits, consecutive visits, first to Washington and then to and, and then to Beijing, Australia's primary ally and our biggest trading partner. Now, um, the visit to Washington, of course, is no surprise, but the visit to Beijing, as you say, does seem to indicate a change in the tone and atmospherics of the relationship. I think there is some truth in that, um, but the real discontinuity there was between the policies of the previous Liberal coalition government that lost office in May last year and the new Labor government that took over from it uh, after the elections. The previous government uh, under Prime Ministers Malcolm Turnbull and Scott Morrison had really sharply changed Australia's approach to China. For a long time, Australia, uh, as their economic relationship with China grew, and notwithstanding the escalating strategic rivalry with the United States, up until 2017, Australian governments attempted to walk both sides of the street. They talked about uh, supporting the United States as rivalry with China grew on the one hand, and they talked about growing the relationship with China on the other. And these two, these two paths proceeded pretty much, you know, um, together, but but uh, obviously pulling in different directions. Then in 2017, and even more strongly after in 2020, um, the, the, the then Liberal coalition governments adopted a much, much tougher approach to China. And that was partly a response to genuine growing concerns about China's power and ambition. It's partly a, con partly a response to the toughening attitudes in Washington, you know, remember 2017 was a year when the U.S. national security strategy first identified China as a strategic rival and began what you might call a present process of, uh, of uh, toughening up towards China. It also reflected a degree of domestic politics in Australia. And I think the, the really distinctive thing about, about the previous government's approach to China was that it did get itself into the position where being seen to be uh, even hostile towards China, certainly deeply suspicious of China, was seen and, and strongly critical of China, was seen by them to be a domestic political advantage here in Australia. Um, now, that turned out to be wrong. In fact, that attitude cost the, the, the previous government seats in the last election, um, uh, but was also, of course, very dysfunctional. The Chinese responded very negatively to some of this stuff. Uh, they, and in particular, they imposed a significant range of trade limitations or bans or, or constraints on some Australian commodities, not the really big ones, but nonetheless quite significant ones. Uh, the, the usually used figure is that uh, Australian exports with a value of something like $20 billion a year were 
very significantly restricted. Um, so that was, you know, that was, and it was also, of course, very uncomfortable for Australia to find itself in a position where its relationship with the world's, with the region's most important power was uh, was was in the deep freeze. And so the new government came to office with a delicate task. It wanted to restore something of a workable relationship with China, see the trade bans removed, see some other issues, including the imprisonment of some Australian citizens resolved, but without appearing to count out of China and without uh, uh, without damaging our relationship with the United States, which, of course, had seen, come to seem even more important, um, particularly in what one might call the AUKUS era. Uh, and so um, Albanese and his foreign minister, Penny Wong, uh, quite adroitly, I think, since they won office in in May twenty twenty, uh, May twenty twenty two, rather last year, have have steadily um, walked back from the coalition's very sort of virulent anti Chinese rhetoric. Have been much more cautious in what they've said about China. On the other hand, the the, the, the Beijing government has been keen to provide opportunities for that process to go forward as well. So what we saw, the kind of culmination of that process from um, that we saw in the visit to Beijing um, last week and over the weekend was that Albanese uh, has restored something of the old um, uh, sort of working relations with Beijing. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the first visit by an Australian political leader in seven years, which is a long time. Um, uh, he's, he seems to have made progress in getting the remaining trade restrictions lifted. An Australian journalist uh, who had been imprisoned in China for very uncertain reasons for three years was released. Uh, uh, and the sort of the, the tone of the, of, the, of the visit was what you might call cautiously warm. Um, so, in, in a sense, what 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 Albanese has done has been to restore a measure of working, you know, day to day working relations with the with the, with the authorities in Beijing. But I don't think uh, we could say that it's taken Australia back to where it used to be. Um, uh, it, I don't think it's it's got us back to the state of mind we had where. Um, for example, in 2014, Xi Jinping was an honoured guest in our in our capital. He addressed the sitting of the joint houses of parliament, which is sort of our equivalent of a joint, addressing a joint sitting of Congress. It was a, um, you know, in those days, uh, the relationship was seen to have virtually no limits. I think it's now seen it's a relationship which has inherent limits. Albanese was quite frank about that. Um, but nonetheless, within those limits, it can function much more effectively as it did in the dark days, so to speak, um, uh, under the previous government. On the other hand, of course, Albanese in doing that has had to be very careful not to alarm Washington, because Washington certainly doesn't want to see Australia slip back to getting too close to Beijing. And I think um, that was what the visit to Washington was really all about. Mm -hmm. I, I have it's, it's a very you know it's a very important uh, topic in in our uh, strategy and future thinking about the you know the coming years um, and, and let me let me pose the following question in the context of our general consider considering how the United States is trying to create the anti-china coalition and decapping the risking whatever you call it and how unsuccessful or successful it is or it might be. So uh, let me ask you a few, few detailed questions because that would well resemble the problems that the Americans probably are, are going to face in, in shaping this coalition. So you, you, I hope I understood properly that the former government lost seats because it was so, you know, it was running this policy of anti-China policy so much. Yeah. Did I understand? Yeah. Yeah. So w what does that mean in detail? And what, what, what happened in, in, in detail? That, 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 I write it's a very interesting question. You see, one of the complexities in this position is that Australia, uh, for you know, several decades now, has run a very open, multicultural, multi-dimensional immigration policy. We have over a million Australians of Chinese extraction. Now, not all of them came from China itself. Some of them came from Greater China, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from Chinese communities in the in Southeast Asia. But the fact is that 
uh, a lot of them have come from you know mainland China and uh, and although you know there's nobody doubts their position as loyal Australians, obviously you know when they hear a very uh, you know crude uh, criticism of China from an Australian government, they're turned off by it. And what's more, the way these things often turn out in immigration in immigrant societies like Australia, uh, these communities of Chinese are quite strongly uh, concentrated in a number of seats. And uh, they are often strongly inclined to support the conservative side of politics because they're kind of conservative, entrepreneurial, business business people type of people. Uh, but uh, it, it seems, and this was um, this was a conclusion drawn by the coalition parties themselves uh, in, in the, as they analysed their election loss last year, that a number of seats were significantly affected by a swing of Chinese. Australian voters from supporting the coalition to supporting Labor because of the coalition's highly adversarial approach to China. I think also more broadly, uh, I mean, there are two factors at work here. Uh, on the one hand, Australians across the board are genuinely very conscious of China's growing power, of its growing ambition, of the way it's very assertively trying to pursue a fundamental change in strategic order in Asia to give it more power and authority and, of course, to minimise, if not completely eliminate, America's role as a strategic leader in the region. And that's worrying for Australians, for reasons that we've discussed before, in fact. But, you know, to put it in a nutshell, it's because Australians have always seen the domination of the Western Pacific by an Anglo-Saxon power, you know, Britain back in the British yeah. imperial days and since World War II, America. We've always seen that as a necessary and sufficient condition for our security. So the idea that China is mounting what looks to be a very formidable challenge, indeed in some ways more formidable than the Japanese challenge in the 1930s and 40s, to Anglo-Saxon, to American primacy in the Western Pacific is very disconcerting for Australians. On the other hand, uh, you know, there, there are, there's, a, there's a degree of realism. People understand that China has arrived. It is now, you know, not just Asia's, by far and away, Asia's uh, strongest power, but also, depending on how you measure it, the world's richest country and a very significant player. And uh, nobody's keen on the idea of us being sucked into a kind of rivalry, uh, let alone conflict with China, uh, at America's behest. And we also don't want to never forget that just how important China is to Australia economically. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in the last few years, there have been some significant um, trade restrictions by the Chinese on Australian imports. But even so, China remains by far our biggest trading export market. Um, it takes well over 30% of our total exports. And if you look at just one commodity, iron ore, which is the biggest, biggest commodity, uh, Australia exports to China something like 1.8 million tonnes of iron ore a day. And the trade is worth something like $120 billion a year. It's a very big trade. It's very important to the whole Australian economy. And so, uh, you know, Australians, on the other hand, they're worried by China, but they're also very conscious that this is not a country we can afford not to get on with. Mm -hmm. And so balancing that, um, is really is really important, and I guess in some ways that the the big question about where Albanese has now got us, where the where, where Australia's positioning between America and China is at the moment, is that you know have have we gone any way towards resolving the deep underlying question that Australia faces in the new reality in which its biggest trading partner and the most powerful country in its region is a very active strategic rival with our biggest ally. Mm. And there's a, there's a really fundamental question here, which I don't think Albanese has effectively addressed. Yeah, yeah. just for his credit, it is very difficult to address this question. Oh, oh sure. But then again, governments, uh, you know, go governments have to address the really hard questions. That's, you know, that's what they're there to do. If it was easy, we'd all do it, mate. True. And in that vein, is my the next question. So, what do you think? What was the, the conversation that Albanese had in, in DC about uh, about the scope of uh, permission, uh, how to trade and deal with China, yeah. or no, or on something else? 
what do you think? What what the, the talks were all about in detail? About yeah. trust building, about um, keeping up with AUKUS agreement. Uh, and, and basically, this question is more less about the Australian strategy, but more about the U.S. strategy, how the U.S. has been playing it recently. Yeah. What do you think about it? Yeah. Especially yeah. given the Sullivan's talk about high walls and small yards thing, and yeah. stuff, you know, yeah. and, and whether yeah. this is workable. Yeah. Look, I think a um, very, very important set of questions. The first point to make is that, you know, Australia, you know, is we're a big country strategic, uh, you know, geographically, but we're, from an American perspective, we're a small country far away. And most of the time, we don't loom very large in American strategic thinking. There was a, fa there's a famous line that Australian strategists and foreign policy types like, like to repeat, and that is that Alfred, but, but Henry Kissinger once said back in the 1970s, I never think about Australia when I'm shaving in the morning. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there's a you know, kind of logic to that. But uh, ever since the United States started thinking of China as a serious strategic rival, Australia has loomed larger and larger in American strategic thinking. Because we are, after Japan, their most significant strategic asset on this side of the on this side of the Pacific, and in a sense that tells you how weak the American position is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we because we're not Japan, uh, and we're a long way from China. We're not actually that much use as a strategic asset in the contest with China, but we're the, but we're the best America has got. And one way of looking at that is that if you you know you go to Washington, you talk to Americans about their approach to responding to China's challenge in East Asia, the things they talk about are AUKUS and the Quad. And Australia is at the heart of both of those. And so for American policymakers, the idea that Australia um, uh, is fully committed to supporting whatever America does it, as America pushes back against China's challenge is really, really pretty important to them. And um, and that's um, and that therefore means that there is an inevitable level of anxiety at the thought that Australia might slide back into a position where, to use a phrase that was very common here back before the relationship with China went bad in 2017, uh, there was a slogan that, that our political leaders and lots of analysts used too that Australia doesn't have to choose between America and China. That we can build the relate, you know, those bigger relationship as we like with China, and have a stronger relationship as we want with the United States, and there's no choice to be made between them. Now, I remember, uh, you know, or, or a lot way, way back um, uh, to 2010 times when Australian political leaders were were saying, were starting to talk like this. I remember American friends and interlocutors in Washington saying to me, "Hugh, you know, that's." I don't like the way you guys say you don't have to choose between America and China. Of course, you have to choose. You have to choose us. Now, you know that 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 that's a very it's a very deep scene. See, they they believe there are choices to be made, and they believe we should be choosing them. And so there, you know, there's a there is a de definitely, and this came through in Albanese's visit. There's definitely a degree of nervousness that Australia might just naively fall back into believing that it could just you know, build as big a relationship with China as it wanted. Now, Albanese was 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 careful in the language he used in Washington to kind of reassure the Americans about that. Um, uh, you know, he, he, he kept saying that he was approaching his visit to China and was approaching the broader process of, of restoration of relations with China uh, cautiously, with open eyes, with, uh, with a clear understanding that um, you know, there, there would be difficulties in a relationship which we shouldn't walk away from and that sort of thing. And he certainly made it absolutely clear that he had no intention of weakening Australia's commitment to support the United States in Asia and, uh, and in particular with things like AUKUS. But also at a slightly higher sort of conceptual level, he made a very interesting observation in a speech he gave as part of his visit in Washington to at, at the State Department, um, uh, up there on the top floor of the State Department, with um, with the Secretary of State and the Vice President present for, uh, on that occasion, in which he said, and this is not a quote, but it's a very close paraphrase. He said, 
look, we all know that China is aiming to um, fundamentally transform the, the order in Asia. And Australia is absolutely committed. He said all countries must be committed to try to prevent that happening, to try and protect the old order in Asia. Now, that's, a, that's an important statement to make because what it tells, what it conveys is that Australia's objective in Asia is exactly the same as America's, and that is to preserve the present strategic or the old strategic order, preserve US primacy as a foundation for the Asian order. And that's important because, you know, going back to a thought you touched on a, a little while ago, um, most countries in Asia, certainly all of the ASEANs, and I think South Korea, um, and to some extent, even elements in Japan actually believe that whatever else we're doing in Asia, we can't preserve the old order. You can't preserve an old order based on US primacy. America's simply not strong enough to do that anymore. What they look for is a new order which recognizes China's growing power, but also sustains a significant US role. Uh, Albanese didn't, didn't touch on that. Albanese said, no, we're, we're with you. We're, we're aiming to support, support the, the, um, uh, the old US-led order. Now, I think that is America's approach, and I think what America's been trying to do is to build up support for that idea amongst uh, all of the countries in the Western Pacific, or indeed in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I think that's been largely unsuccessful. I think Australia and Japan are the only two countries that even begin to support that, uh, that position. Um, I think the, you know, the long story of, uh, of America's position in Asia over the last couple of decades has been one of failure. Um, if you go back to the pivot, for example, uh, uh, Barack Obama's uh, pivot to Asia in 2011, America, you know, talked up the desire to preserve its leadership in Asia and then did nothing material to really action that. Uh, then since 2017, we've had, um, you know, the US overtly declaring China as a strategic rival and, and declaring that it's its number one strategic priority to push back against it. And I think if you look at it diplomatically, if you look at it militarily, for that matter, if you look at it economically, I think it's done very little effective to, to, to support that. And that brings us to the point about economics that you touched on. Um, you know, America has talked about trying to re-establish America's own position as a critical economic partner with Asian countries in order to counteract China's um, position. But it's really done very little to pursue that. It's, um, you know, it launched a, with some fanfare a big, a big, a policy <laughs> to, um, uh, to enhance, um, America's position economically, but it refused to, to countenance any increase in market access as part of that. And that's what the countries in Asia really wanted because, because of course, the protection is precious in the United States. And there's a very clear sense. In Asia, that a lot of what America is doing in the um, you know high fences, small yards initiative yeah. to try and protect strategic industries has not just a, a strategic uh, but also a strong economic protectionist purpose. And of course, it's very awkward for countries in Asia whose own industrialization has been very strongly based on very intimate uh, manufacturing chain. Um, uh, connections with China, and so I think um, you know I think I think uh, I think America does have a problem with where its China policy is going—a very deep and fundamental problem. Uh, and I think that was reflected in the anxieties that that Anthony Albanese went to Washington to assuage. I I don't know how effective Albanese was in doing that. Certainly, all the right noises were made. Um, but I suspect Americans still are still a little bit uncertain about how far they can rely on Australia when the crunch comes. And the, the, the real test on that, for example, is, um, is on the question of, you know, it's just on the military question. Um, you know, AUKUS, uh, the, you know, the, the, the big plan for America to work with Britain to equip Australia with nuclear powered submarines, including on the present of proposals, America passing three or five of their own Virginia-class nuclear-powered submarines to the Australian Navy, that's very much based in America on the assumption that Australia would automatically go to war with China if America ever does. Yeah. Whereas Australian political leaders are very reluctant to make that commitment. We refuse to make that commitment. 
And so that, you know, the on those most fundamental questions, uh, there's a lot of daylight. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, just uh, b- 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 I wanted to change subject to discuss the uh, b- b- Journal Eurasian game, but uh, yeah. <laughs> they've prompted me to to continue on this AUKUS uh, with the, your last statement. So let me let me just ask the following question. You know, there are many analysts uh, across the world, of course, in China and Russia uh, uh, prevailingly, that claim that the AUKUS uh, uh, is so detrimental uh, to Australia because for that reason, for example, that it almost automatically puts uh, Australia, you know, in, in war. And that uh, the, be- and the benefits are coming so late while the Australians are already putting their risk now into the game, that there must be something really behind this deal <laughs> in terms of nuclear capabilities and, you know, the sort of proliferation of nukes. And it was uh, very much so enhanced after those talks that were revealed be- between the Saudis, Israel and Austra- and the United States in the uh, weeks prior to this, you know, Hamas, um, yes, Hamas yes. attack that the Saudis also wanted to have the enrichment, uh, Iranian yes, enrichment yes. thing, uh, to, to be derailed from Iranian deal uh, to midwife by China. Uh, yeah. So it sort of looks as if the Americans were more uh, loose about their non-proliferation uh, posture that they had since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, basically, yeah, in yeah. order to keep preserve the, the status quo in uh, Eurasia and yeah. in the world. Yeah. Uh, and to you know, make sure that their allies feel more protected from the power projection of the you know the emerging powers yeah. in Asia or something like yeah. that. So I, m- maybe you, you might be not comfortable in commenting in detail about that. But how would you react to that? Yeah, look, um, I look. I think I am. I am very skeptical about AUKUS. I am very skeptical about the idea that Australia should be getting nuclear-powered submarines, and I'm very sceptical that we will ever get nuclear-powered submarines. I don't think nuclear-powered submarines make sense for Australia as a force structure choice. I think uh, conventionally-powered submarines are much more cost-effective for Australia than nuclear-powered submarines for the particular purposes we, we have in mind. And as a matter of fact, I don't think the plan which has been set out for us to acquire nuclear-powered submarines under AUKUS is going to work. I think it's a very fragile plan. And so I think this is a a massive folly on Australia's part. And I can understand to a certain extent why people looking at this folly from Beijing or Moscow might think there must be something more behind it. Um, As a matter of fact, I don't think there is. I think it's just a big, stupid mistake. Um, uh, From all the evidence I've seen, I think Australia... Uh, you know, Australian governments genuinely don't contemplate uh, the possibility of Australia at some stage acquiring nuclear weapons, the way, for example, the Saudis obviously do and have for a long time. I have myself, uh, as, as I think you know, in my own writings, explored the question as to whether Australia might ever uh, seek to acquire nuclear weapons. But I've seen no evidence at all that anyone in government here is contemplating that. And all the evidence is that the US has in fact, and in a sense contrary to the sorts of conspiracy theories we've seen, that the US has in fact been very concerned uh, to to close off any suggestion that uh, allowing access, Australia access to nuclear propulsion technology for submarines would in any way constitute a kind of a a thin end of the wedge or a slight opening of the door towards uh, allowing access Australia access to nuclear weapons technology. Uh, if you go back, for example, and look at the language that um, uh, that Biden used in announcing AUKUS and other you know comments he's made about AUKUS, he always says, you know, nuclear powered conventionally armed submarines, and he he repeat you know really repeats that very heavily. So I think America has actually been, and I'm just observing the debate in Washington a bit. I think I think Washington people in Washington have been genuinely very concerned. Some people in Washington, including in the State Department, have been very concerned about the potential for AUKUS to undermine the non-proliferation regime. And there is there is an issue there because the particular reactors Australia would be getting in these submarines would would be fueled with highly enriched uranium 
and uh, and that highly enriched uranium would be under a special provision of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which has never been used, but which has always been there, would be um, uh, exempt from the normal inspection regime under the NPT. And so it does raise, it's not contrary to the NPT because there is this special provision, but it does raise, you know, significant proliferation concerns. However, as a matter of fact, as I say, I don't actually think that that, that is part of the agenda. I think, um, you know, the reality is that, and, you know, this is a, this is a bigger topic, but uh, I, th I think the, the decision to acquire nuclear-powered submarines is a massive mistake, and I think what drove it was a desire on the part of the previous government, particularly as the relationship with China had got so bad in, under them, to find some way, you might say any way, to draw Australia even closer to the United States than we had been. Mm -hmm. And I think, in a sense, the, the, the whole point about the AUKUS plan for Australia to acquire nuclear submarines did not begin in the minds of the people who invented it, uh, both in Australia and in Washington. It didn't begin really with the idea of us acquiring nuclear submarines. It began with the idea of how can we draw Australia and America even closer together? And, and the nuclear powered submarine option looked like a way of doing that. And so I think, um, you know, it is, it is a, a, a serious or structure mistake read of and I think misguided desire to align Australia even more closely with Washington than we have been hitherto. Mm. Yeah, let's let's now shift to the um, US-China uh, direct yeah. relations. Yeah. Uh, you have been, uh, of course, uh, covering this subject uh, over many years, many years before we talked first time, that the war might be coming, that uh, there is quite a chance of escalation. South China Sea in the Taiwanese trade, you were warning the world. You were discussing the correlation of forces. Uh, uh, you also warned that the, the there might be if there is an ex accident, it might quickly spiral out into the Sarajevo dynamics, yeah. 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 the nuclear exchange, and so on. Yeah. Have you noticed that uh, over the last year, in the, in the, in the current year, the debate about the coming war over Taiwan is has become like an everyday talk about the old meal for breakfast. Yeah, uh, across the the world's media, and the scenarios are being presented easily, and even more. And I, I want I would like be very you know happy to know your opinion. Recently, in the Foreign Affairs, there was an article written by some American expert that you know what because there is quite a chance of uh, this incidents uh, down there in this uh, Taiwanese trade. Why don't we just make an agreement with the Chinese that the uh, our f f first use policy of nuclear weapons is not applying uh, so that we understand that if we have an exchange of fire, you know, we are not going down the, the road to this nuclear exchange. OK, so let's yeah. constrain yeah. it within this yeah. potential yeah. exchange. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, and that shows uh, where we are. Yes. In, in, yeah. in this way. By the way, I think that this uh, if. The parties came to terms, came to agreement on that. That would be highly escalatory because that would yeah. Yeah. hell. And then, oh, well, let's do it. <laughs> yes, yeah. Would be, you know, nukes are reconstraining the guys. Yes. So, yes. Uh, what do you think about this sort of the uh, mood of getting accustomed to things that maybe this is even inevitable? This showdown yeah. is really. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about it? No, look, I th it is. A, it is. A, I, I mean, I think it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, as you, you probably recall, I've always regarded as, as as a dangerous situation. One of the differences between my approach to the whole question of the future of U.S.-China relations in Asia, one of the ways in which my approach has been often been different from many others, I've always taken the possibility of war between the U.S. and China more seriously. And I've always, I think, taken more seriously the possibility that such a war would end up as a very big one and probably a nuclear one. Uh, and I think that's that's absolutely true now. Of course, the first thing to note, and this really goes to the Sarajevo point, is that, um, or part of the Sarajevo point, is that if the US and China go to war over Taiwan, or for that matter, over anything else in the Western Pacific, it won't really be over Taiwan. It will be over which of them will be the dominant power in East Asia in the decades ahead. 
Taiwan is, if you like, you know, it's the flashpoint or the test case for um, for that really much, much bigger strategic question. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that although Taiwan is by far and away the most obvious or likely flashpoint, it's not the only one. I mean, for example, during Albanese's visit to Washington last uh, or the week before last, um, Biden, uh, in a joint press conference with Albanese, very deliberately and quite carefully read out what was obviously, obviously a prepared statement in which he stated with what I believe to be more clarity and uh, sort of firmness than Americans had done before, that uh, any attack on, on Filipino forces in the South China Sea would, um, would trigger the, the mutual defense treaty between America and the Philippines. So it, it looked to me like a much stronger and clearer statement that in the event that the kind of tensions we've seen between uh, the Philippines and China in the South China Sea over uh, things like uh, Second Thomas Shoals and so on, um, uh, that if those if those result in an armed clash, America will fight by Beijing by by uh, Manila's side. Now that's something that, that America was absolutely not prepared to say. For example, back in two thousand and twelve, when the Chinese began testing a U.S. resolve in this area. So I think that's you know the the we 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 whilst we shouldn't take our eye off Taiwan because I think it remains very dangerous. I think the possibility that there will be a test of U.S. resolve somewhere else in East Asia, uh, which produces uh, a flash, uh, is also is also quite high. The second point to make is that what I think um, uh, it, when we look at the debate in the U.S. There is a kind of, uh, I think, disconnect. Um, on the one hand, Americans regard it, most Americans regard it as very, very important that America should back Taiwan or, for that matter, other people like the Philippines militarily if they come into a clash with China. And, and so you'll, you'll get very few people who would, who would argue that the United States should not be willing to do that. And Biden himself, of course, as as I'm sure you recall, has no less than four times now gone beyond formal U.S. declaratory policy to say that the United States would fight to defend Taiwan if China attacked and abandon strategic ambiguity. Um, and so that appears to be a very widely held view, and including on both sides of the aisle. On the other hand, um, it's pretty well understood in the United States now that that's not a war that China can win, that, that America can win, I mean that the old superiority that America used to enjoy in um, maritime air forces in particular meant that, you know, if you go back to the Taiwan crisis of 1996, for example, nobody doubted for a moment, and I think rightly, I studied that crisis very carefully from within government at the time, that the United States would have won that, um, inflicted huge damage on China, done received very little damage itself, uh, that would have been a pretty easy war for America to win. That's just not true anymore. And it's, I think, now clearly understood as a result of a lot of war games and things that the United States can no longer expect to win a conventional conflict with China over Taiwan. Um, and so there is this disconnect in thinking. People say, yes, that's a war that Washington should fight, but that's not a war that Washington can win. I mean, I just don't, I just don't get that. Um, and of course, you know, one way of responding to that would have been a massive American effort to build up its forces to restore the, its previous advantage in um, in air and maritime capabilities in the Western Pacific to the level that they used to be in the old days when American victory in such a conflict was assured. But America simply hasn't done that. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm pessimistic about the risks of nuclear escalation. And uh, and why I think the idea of America do, doing that kind of you know the, the deal that you were talking about from that foreign affairs article um, of sort of having a prior agreement that the United States would not exercise its first use policy is is extraordinarily unlikely. And you know there are two reasons for that. The first is that um, I don't think America can afford to forego the first use option. Because if it's going to deter China from attacking, 
it can't deter China from attacking by the use of its conventional forces because its conventional forces won't win. It, re it relies on the threat of nuclear escalation in order to be able to deter China. In other words, America is now in a similar position in the Western Pacific to the position it was in in Central Europe during the Cold War where America had to threaten first use of nuclear weapons to, 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 to counteract the superiority of the Soviet and Warsaw Pact land forces, conventional forces, that it faced across uh, the Iron Curtain divide. Um, and so I, I, I think it would be a major, major mistake for the United States to, to abrogate that. On the other hand, I also the, the other factor, though, is that I, I don't think the United States can rely on China's first use, no first use declarations. Now, China's had a no first use declaration, of course, for a long time. Um, but I don't think you have to be particularly suspicious to recognize that uh, it's not just the United States, but also China that would be that, that would be tempted to escalate across the nuclear threshold. And China has some attractive options. Uh, really that America doesn't have because um, China has a range of nuclear targets in the theatre which are not or not really American territory whereas America has no attractive targets in the nuclear targets in the theatre that aren't Chinese territory and so I think um, it's leaving aside the thought of nuclear weapons as married, as naval weapons which is a different proposition but for example I think the temptation for China to use nuclear weapons against Guam, for example, would be quite high. Um, and you, it's possible to imagine that, that, that Chinese decision makers might imagine that they could put a nuclear weapon on Guam and still deter a, China, a US counter-strike against continental China. Yeah, because there will so, be no equality even escalation, yes, I understand. Yeah, it's a very, and I, you know, this gets us into, you know, the, 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 the wilderness of mirrors of nuclear strategy. But I think, as a matter of fact, I mean, I've thought about this quite a lot over the years and written about it a bit. I think that, I think in, a, in an escalating crisis, the nuclear balance between the US and China will be very unstable. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, and this, gets us to kind of, you know, the final point in this. And that is that, you know, we're back all the way back in November, I think it was even, uh, of 2021, when the Russian build-up on Ukraine's borders just was just becoming apparent publicly. <laughs> and Biden was starting to warn Russia against an attack. He, he, he all the way back then said... Uh, there is no way the United States is going to intervene militarily. And the phrase he used was, we're not going to fight World War Three." Yeah. Now, one of the questions I put to my American counterparts and never receive a satisfactory answer is, if Biden is not prepared to fight World War Three over Ukraine, which, which is, after all, you know, a UN member, why is it prepared to fight uh, World War Three over Taiwan? Because that's what it would be. A war over Taiwan would be World War Three. In fact, I think it'd become World War Three much quicker than a war, a war over Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, my bottom line on this is that, notwithstanding all the language we have out of Washington, the f the fact that, and notwithstanding the way that Americans tend to take it for granted that that of course the U.S. would and should defend Taiwan, I think there's a very high likelihood that. When the time came at three o'clock in the morning, as these things always seem to happen in the Situation Room in the White House, when a U.S. president faced the choice, <coughs> and if he or she was, you know, properly advised about the risks involved and the potential for nuclear escalation and so on, I, th I think they'd say no. I think they'd back off, mm. um, and that's. You know, if you if, if if and if you look at, for example, the nervousness that you see in South Korea and, for that matter, in Japan, about America's reliability as an ally in a nuclear crisis, I think that that gets to the heart of it. Yeah, well, uh, adding to that, Biden at that time also added that the minor incursions into Ukraine would not be uh, yes, that's right, minor <laughs> yes. incursions. So, and that of course, 
alerted <laughs> everybody along the NATO Eastern flank that what the minor incursions in terms of Article Five would mean. But yeah, yeah, but uh, things have changed, and you know, remember that uh, Biden was speaking about it at the time after the Kabul debacle, after this yes. Nord Stream thing when the U.S. Yes. seemed yes. very weak. But now, yes. on the flip side, I want to sort of, um, I want to test on you, if I may. The following proposition: uh, How the strategic community in DC might be thinking these days after two years' war in Ukraine, and after all this, you know, embargo, technology, semiconductors, yeah. and, yeah. and all this thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, when when I uh, listened to Elbridge Colby, and when I heard uh, when I read his book twice, by the way, yeah. Uh, yeah. Denial. Yeah. And uh, when I listened to Sullivan, <clears throat> and when I see. In proximity, how the war in Ukraine unfolds and how the Americans yes. are behaving, I increasingly feel that there might they there might be a temptation to limit the war, because apparently, more and more American decision makers are thinking that there might be a chance for r- waging a limited war with a nuclear power, you know, and pre- you can prevail. In this, yes, this yes, thing. yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as the sh- case of Ukraine shows, where the war is waged in the Russian heartland, uh, the Russia is attracted. Americans are running the show, basically, with this teaspoon strategy of delivering weaponry. Uh, s- that you know the sequencing strategy that they announced prior to the war that first they need to deal with russia by treating it and then they will f- face china at the same time because of two sort of ceilings existence of nuclear weapons is creating yes. huge pressure on decision makers to really think twice before moving up the escalation ladder. Yeah. So either yeah. both Russians, Chinese, Americans are, you know, trying to play within some sort of rules of the war. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And also existence of the uh, globalization with those supply chains, you know, everything is creating both a very complex system of leverages and also some limitations. And Americans might be thinking, Having the U.S. dollar, having the alliance system, having you know the distance from Eurasia, that they can manipulate this big board of you know complexity, and I increasingly feel that they think they are winning this. If we if we would call it a scalable world war already, you know, yes, yes, they yes. think that they might be winning it. And the the, the speech of Biden's uh, the the recent Biden speech over Israel and Ukraine. Yes. It's suggesting that they want to be the arsenal of democracy, that they are in the war mood, and they will not, not, uh, you know, uh, hesitate to follow on, follow through on this strategy of primacy. How would you comment on that? Yeah, like okay, it's a very interesting question. Look, um, <coughs> I, I think there has been a kind of what you might call modest triumphalism in Washington uh, ab- about their success in mobilizing international opinion uh, uh, over Ukraine. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of, we've, we've seen the administration itself make this claim, but I think also a lot of commentators and analysts have been saying, you know, oh, this shows America's back. Look, we're leading the world uh, in, in this response. Um, and that does, I think, lead to a certain degree of optimism about America's capacity to handle other things. There was a strong sense, as you'll recall, uh, particularly in the earlier stages of the uh, Ukrainian war, uh, that that Russia's early failures would help to deter China from trying it on uh, over Taiwan. I, I was always very sceptical about that, I might say. But um, uh, and and of course the the other point was that that as, as part of the one of the things the US was happy about was was its relative success in um in mobilizing an international economic response in terms of putting very stringent or what appeared to be very stringent sanctions on russia um i i think there is very little grounds for american optimism that this will allow them to stabilize the challenge to the us-led global order the way they hope it it, it has um uh, my reason for saying that is uh, first of all that of course they haven't defeated Russia. Um, you know, the fact is that, I mean, this is a war, you know, a lot better than I do. But, you know, it does seem to me that we're now uh, 18 months in 
and uh, as uh, as uh, General Zaluzhny 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 told the Economist last week, um, you know, this this is a stalemate. I don't, yeah. That's the way it looks. To, that's the way it looks to me. Russia and is not losing it. Russia is not losing this war. That's... Is not losing it, and 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 probably time is on Russia's side. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I'm hesitant in my judgments about this because it's not a an area I know well. But it doesn't look to me. It looks to me like time is on Russia's side, and that the sanctions, although they obviously had some impact, have not prevented Russia both sustaining and potentially expanding its its war potential. It doesn't appear to have fatally damaged Putin's position. Um, uh, so I think, you know, I'd, I think it's w w way too early to call that a success. It's also, I think, worth bearing in mind that Putin has already, has all the time been using his nuclear weapons very successfully. That is the, 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 the ultimate, the, 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 the very clear constraint that that's, that the risk of escalation has imposed on, uh, on Washington and what Washington's been prepared to provide to Ukraine has been, uh, you know, by the risk of escalation, it could lead to a nuclear exchange. Uh, that 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 is that is nuclear weapons doing their job, if I can put it that way. So I I think, um, you know, I think we we need to be very guarded about our about optimism about all of that. And the other point to make, of course, is that although much has been achieved, much has not been achieved. The failure to mobilise what one might broadly call third world or global south opinion, uh, the way in which so much of the India, of course, China, of course, um, uh, but a lot of the rest of the third world um, have failed to align against Russia is significant. Um, and I think that's uh, that's been a blow to America's capacity. And I think we're seeing a kind of similar process play out with the uh, reactions to the uh, appalling events of uh, 7 October. Um, and the other point is that I, I'm very doubtful that China believes it has much to learn, at least at the high strategic level, from what's happened to Russia um, because uh, over, over, over Ukraine. Um, I think that Chinese may well believe that they are much better prepared to act against Ukraine than Russia against Taiwan than Russia was against Ukraine, um, and that their position is inherently stronger. Um, apart, apart from anything else, um, if I can put it this way, Taiwan has no Poland; it has no neighbours. Exactly. There's no, you know, there's there's no there's no border across which supplies can can, and can which fly. is a sanct NATO sanctuary, by the way. So it's all yeah. the double downs on Russians' decision making whether to go to the nuclear weapons. It, yeah, it, it's a it's a different strategic landscape. It's true, and US has to, yeah. to act directly, not from behind the allies. Yeah, that's 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 exactly right. Exa that's exactly right. Um, you know, it's just it's. I mean, and there's a question then about whether Japan and Australia would 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 join in. But my argument is, uh, actually, I don't think either of them would. But the real point is whether they do or not doesn't make any difference. Um, you, you know, America can't win a war with China over Taiwan, whether Japan and Australia join in or not, and nobody else would for sure. So um, uh, I think uh, I, I think the any reassurance that America takes um, from from its experience of the last eighteen months uh, would be premature. The other point to make is, I mean, like you, I, I've I've known Elbridge Colby for quite a while. I'm a great respecter of his work. Um, but I, um, I've always been very skeptical of his, uh, hope, I think is the right word to use, uh, that, uh, one could, so to speak, design a constrained, limited, uh, conflict, uh, with China, um, which would be limited in ways which would make it easy for America to win. Uh, I don't think China has any interest in playing that game. Because, of course, you know, the fundamental, well, one of the fundamental asymmetries between America and China in relation to Taiwan is simply that China cares more. Uh, this, this is, you know, this is oh, California. Oh. Yeah. The, this and, is uh, and so in the balance, the, uh, the balance of resolve is overwhelmingly, uh, is overwhelmingly, uh, in China's advantage. And so, 
you know what what Colby's um, proposal for a limit of war does is to signal to China the limits of U.S. resolve. Colby wants a limited war because America is not prepared to fight an unlimited one. Fine, then the Chinese present America with an unlimited one and America backs off. That's actually what the Chinese strategy is. So I think what Colby actually does is to send to the Chinese exactly the signal the Chinese want to hear. And rather than undermining deterrence, rather than strengthening deterrence, it undermines it. And of course, I think he's right. I don't think America is prepared to fight an unlimited war with China over Taiwan because in the grand sweep of history, the stakes for America in preserving its leadership in Asia by preserving Taiwan are much lower than the stakes it had in preserving its role in East, in Western Europe in the face of the Soviet threat during the Cold War because to com- compress a very complex argument into a short sentence, during the Cold War, if the Soviets had dominated Western Europe, they'd have been very well placed to dominate the whole of Eurasia. Whereas China, even if it dominates Taiwan, even if it dominates the whole of East Asia, is never going to be able to dominate the whole of Eurasia because there's too much power there elsewhere. Exactly. There's Russia, there's India, and so, so the on. Americans could well withdraw to the position of uh, the the real equilibrium balancing Westphalian system, with them being one of the strongest, if not the strongest player in the system. Why yeah. they, they don't want to give it up? They want to have the primacy thing, right? Still, yeah, yeah, no, that's right, and I mean. You know, really, <laughs> uh, I mean, it does seem to me that the, the world is already essentially a multipolar system. And the question is whether America can be persuaded to accept a position as one of the strongest poles in a multipolar system, dominant in its own hemisphere, yeah. um, and still immensely powerful, but not playing a leading role throughout Europe. and in East Asia. And the last question, there is uh, an upcoming meeting between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. And yeah. It's very soon. So what yeah. would you expect of this meeting? What would the gentleman be talking about and what would be the outcome? Look, I think I, I expect very little from it. Um, I think, you know, clearly, <laughs> you know, I think what we've seen in the Biden administration was a, 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 a very uncertain start. You remember the Anchorage meeting, which was their first substantive interaction, which turned into a yelling match. Um, and then um, uh, an attempt, and then some, you know, some quite tough actions, an attempt to warm things up. That was, that was then frustrated by the absurd balloon um, crisis of uh, February yeah. this year. I think, you know, we've, what we've seen is is a, a willingness by the administration over the last six months since then to to look for ways to rebuild some working level and workable communications. Um, but I think there is when all the talk we we see from people like Blinken about guardrails and so on, indeed, and talk from from Biden himself about building guardrails, uh, I think it, I think is a is a misunderstanding of the nature of the problem in the US-China relationship. But talk about guardrails suggests that what, what we have is a basically stable relationship which might accidentally run off the road. Um, and the guardrails are there to stop those sorts of accidents. But that's not what's going on. What's going on between America and China is a fundamental and well-articulated and well-understood divergence in fundamental strategic objectives. China wants to take America's place as the dominant power in West, East Asia and the Western Pacific. America wants to stop it doing so. And, and there's, there's, in, in the end, all the rest is just, so to speak, you know, incidental. As long as the US and China have that fundamental divergence of strategic objectives, then their relation is going to be fundamentally adversarial. And, and the risk of that adversarial relationship, of that adversary relationship flaring into war is going to remain very high, which gets us back to where we yeah. started from. Yeah, in a way, it's it's worse than during the Cold War because the well, the Soviets and the Americans had good reasons to sustain their relationship and keep oh. their red lines intact. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think it is. I think it's it is uh, worse in some ways, more unstable than during the Cold War. Because one of the characteristics of the Cold War was that both sides treated their adversary essentially as an equal. 
and conceded to their adversary a sphere, their sphere of influence. Now, of course, you know, at the margins, they were always sort of, you know, toying with one another. But, you know, in the end, you know, Yalta happened. Uh, you know, your country and others was were, were surrendered by America to the Soviet sphere of influence. And talk of rollback in Washington never got anywhere. And and in the end, at the various occasions uh, during the Cold War, when when the Soviets rolled into Eastern Europe and crushed things, you know, Poland, of course, and Hungary and Czechoslovakia and so on, the Americans stood back and said, "Okay, that's your part of the world. You do it." Sure. And 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 it it regarded Russia as a as an equal. They were two equal superpowers. Now the fact is that the United States today does not concede the status of an equal to China, and it does not concede to China its own sphere of influence. Indeed, the whole, you could say, the, the whole dynamic of the US-China strategic rivalry is China seeking to assert a sphere of influence in East Asia and the Western Pacific, and the United States saying, no, that's, you know, we're, we're not prepared to tolerate that. And so, in in fact, the, 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 what kept the Cold War kind of stable was that the two sides were sort of saw one another as equals, and both were trying to defend, prevent that that being eroded. China sees itself as being held down beneath the United States and seeks to put itself in the same position the Soviet Union was in. And that means that that the the drive for China to assert its equality with America is is very strong. And, you know, in a way, during the Cold War, both the US and the Soviet Union were status quo powers trying to prevent the other from undermining the status they already had. China is not a status quo power. It yeah. seeks to fundamentally transform the, re- the regional order in its favour. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for this. Well, it's a great pleasure as always. It's always, it's always yeah. really fun to talk to you. So right, thanks right. for the opportunity. It was great. Uh, uh, yeah, I hope uh, to, you know, looking, for, looking forward to, to having another one soon. Thank you very yeah, much. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Hugh White was our guest at Strategy in Future, and you stay with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.